All right, so hello everyone and welcome to True Neutral. We are a high fantasy tabletop RPG based around cinematic realism and storytelling. I am Caitlin, the Dungeon Master today. Uh, before we get started, um, just to kind of clue you guys in on what's going on here, this is a continuation of a game that I've been running for about three years now uh, with a variety of different players. Um, the universe is original. We play by a homebrew rule set, but you D&D veterans will probably be able to recognize some 3.5, some Pathfinder roots in there, uh, all sorts of good stuff. Um, from there, uh, for you number crunchers, just want to let you know that because our gameplay style is heavily based in storytelling and roleplay, uh, there's not a whole lot of die rolling compared to traditional rules, but you know, don't sweat it. We will roll dice. You will see that. Uh, let's see. This week's divination is the Wheel of Fortune. If you guys want to read more about that, uh, check out Command Tarot. You'll see that scrolling up above me here. And now I'll turn it over to the players to introduce themselves and their characters. You guys are good? Hey everyone, uh, I'm Jake. I'm playing the character Alistair. Uh, quick things you might need to know. He is an ex-assassin masquerading as the... Ca calm down. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> masquerading as the left-handed son of a blacksmith, Gideon Lyris. Uh, I stand about six foot tall. I'm in my mid to late 30s. I have pretty long hair that I keep pulled back in a half ponytail, and I wear well-maintained leather armor along with a long sword at my right hip, a couple daggers here and there uh, to be nice and assassiny. Um, my face generally looks like mine, just a little more chiseled, higher cheekbones are a bit sharper. Uh, I have pale blue eyes with a copper uh, starburst, I guess you could say, that come out from the iris. Um, otherwise, if you just basically take me and pack on a whole bunch of lean, toned muscle and about four inches in shoulder width <laughs> and about like three inches up here, then it's basically Alistair, so. All right, and I am Kiefer, and I'm going to be playing Griffin, son of Hadar. He is a plainsman or a barbarian. Uh, the most noticeable things is that he's taller. He looks kind of like me. He has the, you know, the mohawk, and then... He's got a nice dark sealskin cloak on that kind of takes up the most of your vision. He's got some chainmail on that's kind of silvery. And then every once in a while you can see the two hilts of two maces on his hips. Right here. A couple of small red orb earrings. They dangle there sometimes. I forget about them half the time. Uh, he's got a pretty noticeable scar here on one half of his shaved head. And then a less noticeable bite mark here. Not too noticeable. Sometimes I forget about that too. That's fairly faded at this point. It's a pretty old wound. Uh, his demeanor, he's generally very imposing. I hope that comes through during this. His default position is kind of crossed arms. But don't worry, he's not, he's a nice guy sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. You guys good? I think we're good. All right. So a uh, quick recap of what is going on right now. Uh, both Alistair, aka Gideon, and Griffin are in the city of Crescent Keep. It's the capital of Braddon, one of the southern kingdoms. They are both looking for a black court dragon uh, for their own reasons, but because of their similar goal, they've chosen to work together. They've completed some contracts throughout the city, uh, some quests in the past eight days or so that they've been here. Uh, they've just recently learned that the dragon that they're seeking is actually here in the city. Uh, his name is Bakhtin Vath. He's the Black Court King. Um, he's masquerading as a human and as the Emperor of Braddon. So they're doing what they can right now to get an audience with him for their own reasons. And that's where we are at this moment in the story. Okay, so we were leaving the tavern? We were leaving the tavern. Okay, so you go get papers forged for noble birth? Mm. So that we can gain entry more easily 
and also so we can get into St. Gawain's Day, which is what, two, din, two ten days from now? A little less. A little less? A little less than two ten days to the St. Gawain's Festival, and it'll also help us get entry to the palace. And it'll help you get a house. <laughs> yeah. So you can become all domesticated. Yep. <laughs> we'll see how long I actually stay in that house. See how long that house lasts. It'll be it'll be nice to have it, you know. It's nice to have a sort of base of operations. Because yeah, we've been staying thing. in a tavern every day since we got here, and if we're gonna stay here for another month and a half, I think I'd like a house. I think that's fair enough. I'll bite. But uh, I'm actually gonna let you take the lead on this one, and <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna follow you. Um, It'll be pretty evident that I want you to take the lead, and so unless we're, you specify otherwise. Are we are we heading from the tavern after sleeping? Is that what you guys did last? Can't really remember. Because you you went to sleep at the tavern. I think it was a soldier's rest. Mm -hmm. You guys didn't sleep for very long. Around noontide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in that case. I'll go downstairs and I'm gonna go get some food. Okay. So, they're serving just a sort of bland porridge this morning. It's no meat, nothing like that, but it's enough to... No meat. No meat. Sorry, playing some in, there's no meat. How much for two bowls? It's a penny. It's a penny? Mm -hmm. I'll pay him a penny. Her a okay. penny. Them a penny. Alright, so, as you're eating, um, people sort of filter in and out. It's Clearly, people can tell by the smell of the cooking that there's no meat this morning, so there is not a huge breakfast crowd. You hear, as usual, the familiar sound of thunder rolling overhead, typical here in Crescent Keep. You don't hear any rain yet, which is a good sign. Oh, thank God. But as, but as, always, but as always, the thunder is there. Oh, oh, no, of course. If you don't come downstairs, I'll bring you a bowl. No, don't worry about it. I'm following you close behind, and I'll maybe turn up my lip if there's no meat in it, but I'm not going to turn up free food because you've already bought it. Oh, 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 that's good. That's good. The uh, familiar tavern wench, Faye, is going around uh, serving beer, and it's, it's, a, it's morning beer. It's, it's not anything strong if you decide to buy any of that. It's Shogol. Is that the name of the order? Shagol, yeah. Shagol is actually not here this morning. A rare occurrence, but... A pleasant oh. surprise. No one is sitting at his table, that little table that's pushed over to the side next to the wall, kind of close to the hearth. Um, it seems like people expect him to be here, so no one's taking that seat. Yeah, I'm not going to take that chair. Okay, <laughs> that's, and that's fine. I wouldn't suggest that you do. I will abstain as well. Okay. Um... No, I'm just. I'm not gonna make much conversation. I'm just gonna eat the food, ready to go, ready to follow you. All right. All right. Uh, once I'm done, I'll stand up and begin walking towards the door. Okay. Following him. Off you go. The streets outside are pretty busy. I mean, it's it's what eight in the morning or so. You didn't sleep till all the way till noontide. I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's fairly early in the morning. Uh, people are still out and about though. Um, it's it's late enough for most most commoners to, at this point to be awake. Nobles may still be asleep, but it's gonna be us soon. Uh, I'm just gonna make a beeline for um, the slums. Okay. So we can go to Mentha. Are now blacksmith and forger. Okay. Forger you... of weapon and paper. Ooh. Well, you don't know if she's gonna forge anything for you. Hopefully she will. Uh, but... Hopefully. Yeah, I'm hopefully. Hoping, hoping so. We'll see. See what happens. Hopefully, nothing or no one interrupts us. All right. So. You wanna. Do the conversation? Or would you like me to go outside? I'll be fine. Okay. So, from where you are in the city right now, 
you're in the market district where you've been staying at this at this inn slash tavern. Uh, to get all the way over to the slums, it takes you about an um, hour and 20 minutes. It's this The city is enormous, especially uh, now that you know, the, the day is getting on, people are starting to pack and clog the streets. It, it takes you a while to get there, and when you finally get to the slums, there's really no relief in foot traffic. It's the most crowded part of the city, other than the market district. So you're headed straight to the blacksmiths, right? That's the plan. Okay. So you, uh, you've been here plenty of times before. You know where it is. It might have been a couple of days since you've been here, but I think that every visit has been notable enough that you remember. Oh, yes. You remember where it is. I, I think I think I know exactly where it is. Uh, you don't hear the ring of uh, iron on an anvil, but I mean, you know you know enough where it is to not have to follow that sound. Um, and when you get close enough, you can see that there there is smoke uh, billowing out of the furnaces and things. They are hot, um, but you all you see are apprentices. You do not see the dark-skinned half-elf wandering around beneath the awning. After you, uh, I'll scan around. Does it look like um, are the uh, shutters or the uh, upstairs bedroom open? They are. They are. Do I see like shadows moving or anything of the sort? Uh, you don't see any shadows upstairs. The shutters to the lower window are open, and I mean you you can see Mentha pretty clearly when you get close enough moving around inside. Okay. Straight for the upstairs window. She's right there. Oh well, you know what? <laughs> Maybe she slept late. All right. All right. Maybe I have a preference. Perhaps we should wait until she begins working. Or we could ask for forged papers before she comes out here in the public. <laughs> True. After you. I was going to use the fact that I need to have my armor repaired. But I will approach the front door. Okay and knock lightly. Sure. Um, as you approach and knock, the door is right next to the window. She's right next to it. She just glances out and she sees you and for a split second she hesitates a little bit as though she's thinking about not answering it, but it's too late. Shutters are open. You've seen her. Uh, she comes right around a couple of steps and opens the door up. She is dressed in her her smithing apron and everything as though she's, you know, been working outside. There's there's soot on her hands. Um, so, brief overview for those of you who do not know what Mintha looks like. Mintha is a half-elf. Uh, her skin is a, sort of a creamy, dark cocoa color. Um, I'll draw up a picture of her for you all to see in our little window down there where you see a D20. You guys are welcome to talk amongst yourselves too while I do this. Oh, I don't really have much to say to yeah. you right now. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm, also, I'm, also, I'm also standing right You're in front of her. <laughs> so she like freezes and I turn no, to you. I can't talk to you in game at all. Yeah, That's there fine, there she is. There she is. Mm. All right. You calm down. She has a husband. You calm down. He, he thinks he's her husband. Okay. He probably is, though. So, <laughs> he probably, probably is. So, uh, she, she opens the door up, dressed in her smithing gear, and she smiles politely, but there is, there's a certain tightness to the smile that indicates she's not all that pleased with your visit. I'm leaning around his head. Her eyes soften just a little bit, and she says, uh, what can I do for you? We require your services. Smithing? No. Her eyes narrow a little bit and sort of dart around to the sides and... What do you mean, Gideon? You have a hole in your leather jerkin. 
Well, I do. Just c- come inside, and, and she waves you in. I go in. I, I okay. Follow, I follow. She shuts the door. She closes the shutters, and um, she actually walks to the little back room in you know, her humble little house. It's it's very narrow. Um, there's not a whole lot of room for anyone to really be in here. But nevertheless, she goes to that small back room where you spoke with Radu, and she checks comes back and seems satisfied there's no one there. She sort of spreads her hands and says, you know, what is it this time? We need, I'll, I'll look outside and see if anyone would be able to hear us from the window. She's sort of, she's led you away from it. We need a forger. So she nods ever so slightly so she's contemplating the reasons for why you would need something like this, and she says, why? We're trying to gain entry into the palace. Her eyes get really big at that, and she again shakes her head down. She says, I why? I to buy a house. It'll be easier if I have a name. You're taking up residence here? You're both taking up residence here? Likely not. No, it's a little. She says, so you you want the full noble package then? For both of us. Okay. Um, let me see what I have. She turns around and goes upstairs. And you uh, hear her kind of shuffling around up there. You hear drawers being pull, pulled open, papers being shuffled, and then finally, you know, the Apollo sound of her stepping down the cheap, rickety stairs again. And she's holding a scroll in either hand, and they're small, um, very slender things, and they're, they're both uh, wrapped up with pretty ornate ribbon. And she says, I hope the names don't matter. I suppose they don't. I suppose not. She hands them both respectively to you to take and open up and look at. Do they seem pretty official? They seem really, really official. And you, yours says that you are Lord Pate. Yours says you are Lord Eldridge. And both of you, you know, these these uh, forged noble trees, family documents, uh, have very, very complex family trees on them, and they, they almost look overtly complex, as though someone wanted to make sure that they wouldn't be easily traceable if they were really, really looked over. But it seems like you both have roots over in Vereen and maybe a little bit in Casoria. So congratulations on that. You said uh, Lord Eldridge? Lord Eldridge. Lord Eldridge, Lord Pate. And you're- I'm Sorry, did you want that? Just, Eldridge is pretty sweet. Sorry. Pate's great too. But... Sorry, Gideon. She raises her eyebrows at you as though to ask, you know, are you satisfied with that? Mm-hmm. Do we need a- Stamp, and I'll pull out the citizen card and hand it to her. She says, yes, you would need a stamp. But I can't just give you a stamp for free, if you understand. I was not expecting these papers for free. We're on the same page. She informs you that she will charge you both 500 gold per family tree. Her family tree? You just need some both yeah. of us, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. All right. And the nobleman's stamp is going to be 100 gold. So I'll produce six platinum. Okay. And so will I. And hand them over. So her eyes shine as she takes the coins, but she obviously, you know, is attempting to quell it, you know, out of politeness. But you can assume fairly easily by her expression that either it's been a long time since she's seen platinum coins, or maybe she's never seen them. 
Regardless, she takes them, holds them up, you know, bites them. Of course, kind of politely off to the side. She doesn't openly do it in front of you. Uh, she counts them twice, puts them in a coin pouch, and then she says, keep those on your belt, keep them in sight. Um, don't let anyone, especially a sorcerer, take them from you to look over. They're as official as they can get without being official. Understood. Also, and I'll just point at my left shoulder where the hole in my curious is. She wrinkles her nose distastefully. It was my reaction, too. No, your reaction was more like, Griffin, help me. I'm poisoned. <laughs> How did you manage that? I was shot by a poisoned crossbow bolt. Oh. You can actually tell now that she is repressing concern. She says, uh, would you leave your, would you leave that piece here today for me to fix? Would it just take a day? I could make it a day. Would I be able to take another with me? I might have something. She gestures for you to follow her, and as she's opening up the door, she stops and turns around to look at you, and she says, uh, keep those scrolls hidden until you're in nicer clothes. Then she steps outside. I'm just gonna go ahead and put those away. Okay. <clears throat> so she guides you around uh, to the overhang where the furnaces are, and walks past all the apprentices busy at work. It looks like she has a couple new ones. Uh, typically, they're you know the two uh, boys that you recognize. Um, there is a third boy and uh, a young girl now all working here. She Mintha goes over to one of her many many tool benches and um, all of the things hanging on the walls, and she pulls down a, a decent looking cuirass. It's it's leather. Mm -hmm. It's if anything, from for your trained eye, you can see that it's not a really quality piece. You definitely wouldn't want to be shot with the same arrow that you've been shot with in that curious, but... It'll do the job. And it looks nice. That's the main thing. Oh, okay. So, she brings that over to you and sort of impassively holds it up for your inspection, turns it around. She puts it down on a table and she gestures for you to take off that curious. Alright, so I'll begin taking it off. I'll do my left arm first. Okay. And then I will very gingerly do my right arm. Okay. What's she rolling for? Pain. Okay. Uh, 14. Alright, so... You uh, sort of expected her to allow you to take the curious off, and then, and then while you know you were doing that, she might go look through the pieces that she has for you. But she did the opposite. She got the curious first, and now she's standing almost impatiently waiting for you to take your armor off. So you have to kind of hurry a little bit, and um, you manage to keep from clenching your teeth until it's you know kind of over your face. And then you, you know, really grit your teeth, but as soon as it passes back over your face and you're visible again, you manage to uh, pull that mask of, I'm not hurting up anymore. And you, you pass the curious over to her. Uh, okay. I will don the other. Okay. Um, you do get the opportunity to kind of put this one on a little slower than you had to take the other one off. Mm -hmm. Uh, she takes your damaged cuirass over to a table, lays it out, um, and you notice there's not a whole lot of unfinished pieces lying around, so you, you would assume that you're going to be able to get yours back pretty quickly. How much would this cost? Uh, without turning around, she says that it's, uh, it's a pretty bad hole, and she's able to, like, stick, you know, three fingers in it. She says... And I'd charge about 15, 20 gold. Okay. Would you like me to pay you now, or...? You can pay me now. And she turns around and faces you. Oh, 
aggressive. Uh, okay, I'll hand her 25 gold. She takes the coins and her eyes flick over them really quickly. And then she takes five of those gold pieces and puts them on the table next to you, walks over to a fairly big coin pouch she has and puts, puts that money in it. I wasn't actually meaning to give her extra. <laughs> you weren't meaning to give her extra? No, I just, for some reason, I heard 25. Oh. So I'll take the other 25 gold pieces. Okay. So uh, she says, because it's, it's pretty early in the morning, um, and she doesn't have a whole lot of work right now. You seem to be one of her first commissions of the day. Uh, she tells you with her back, back to you as she's actually already pulling on gloves and that sort of thing. Uh, they're really, really slender, thin gloves meant for leather working. Um, she says uh, that come back at the end of the day. It should be ready. Thank you. You see a sharp nod of her head. I'll send you regards to hide off. She kind of almost coyly looks over her shoulder and, and raises an eyebrow. And she says, how's his curious? I think it's still fully whole. She says, it better be. But it's, she says it sort of with a joking tone. No, no real underlying menace. I'm ready when you are. I'll leave. Okay. So. Get out of there fast. So you have left, you've left your curious with her. Mm -hmm. And all she's doing to it is she is repairing that bolt hole. Yeah. I just, an arrow, like an arrow hole would be nowhere near as bad, it's, but it's a bolt. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it should be ready. Well, Gideon, my own silks are damaged enough, so I think we might have to stop soon. It would appear that I need an upgrade anyways. What else do we have to do? Can I add a game? I think that our plan was go get the forgeries made and we got, st we got stamps from her and then go to the palace, but I mean, we do need finer clothes. Yeah, so finer clothes in the palace? Finer clothes in the palace. And we did get the stamp, right? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. You got, you got your stamps. You paid 100 gold for your stamps. Yeah. So <laughs> how, how nice is this curious? Curious Looking. that you're wearing? Oh, Looking. it's, it's, uh, it's very sleek. It's very pretty. Uh, but it's it's certainly not something that you want to, I don't know, go fight those river monsters in or take another bolt to the chest in. But is it something that I could go be a noble in? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, this this sort of curious is the sort of thing that you would see uh, noblemen's sons, you know, astride horses and things. I mean, they're, they're meant to be pretty. What son am I? What son are you? Uh, Third, fourth. Your family tree is so convoluted, and it's not, uh, the family tree is not, you know, written in sort of stair-stepping mm -hmm. order, so it's all over the place. Could I just say that I'm like fourth son? Oh yeah, you could Keep definitely- Keep my ring gear on? Yeah. You could definitely lie about it, pretend like you're the son that's meant to be out adventuring, if you don't want to, you know, change your clothes and make well, up another backstory. I mean, you already have a silk cloak. It's, oh, no, that's silk skin. Still skin. It's still nice. It's still nice. So, Mine is like canvas, basically. I mean, I, either one of you honestly could uh, be, you know, the adventuring son or the son that went into the military. I mean, you, you both have either look about you, or whichever way you you want to go. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll don my uh, wolf skin. Okay. Well, or pelt, pelt, my wolf pelt. My pin is still on, right? Yes, I don't believe you ever took it off. I don't think so either. I'll just brush it off and make sure it's still there. Okay. What does it look like? It's, uh, it's, a uh, it's about that big. It's, um, of a silver dragon, and it's, um, like, eating its own tail. It's in a circle. Okay. Okay. That's what it looks like. You just, you and your dragons. I'm ready to go. I'll be... Fourth son adventurer. Sure. 
Sure thing. I don't like silks anyway. I'll also be. I mean, you'll still be expected to dress up a little bit. For I mean, for St. Gawain's Day. Yeah. Yeah, for then. I'll, I'll get it for then. But to go buy a house. I don't know. You might still want to dress up to go buy a house. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, make our. I'm gonna start making my way towards the market district if you do not mind. Is the market district the best idea, or maybe the sorcerer's noble district? There's shops in the nobles district. At least the jeweler. Ah, yes, that's right. That's right. We could go find ourselves. Which would you prefer, sorcerers or the noble? I don't think there were any shops in the noble district. Well, Let's just go to the sorcerers. The sorcerers district. It is. All right. Lord Pate. Lord Pate. Eldridge. Eldridge. Eldridge Horror. And that's Eldridge. Not Eldritch, just in case. Yeah, that's what he wrote. Okay. So, we're just looking for a uh, seamstress, right? Yeah, um, it, I went to the shop in the market district and it was Hilda's shop. That's right. And she fixed up my cloak. Did, she didn't really have anything too, too nice though, was it? It was a nice store, but it wasn't really for silks and nobles. You actually weren't able to see everything that she had. Um, the fact that she was able to very, very quickly and easily fix your sealskin cloak suggests that she's highly skilled and that she, I mean, she probably has a lot of, a lot of clientele. She, in the end, is probably able to buy really, really nice material. You guys were at the front of the store. She's probably not going to keep her really good stuff at the front anyway. Thieves and the like. I will ask you if you want to return to Hilda's. Gladly. <laughs> All right. Was okay. it Hilda or Hilde? It's like Hilda. Hilda. Like yeah. Hilda. Okay. Yeah, it's like the e. The e doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but it's there. So, back to the uh, back to the market district. So streets at this point are even more packed. Mm -hmm. It's about an hour and a half this time. Like you get stuck behind a mule cart for a fair amount of time. But you know, he eventually turns off and you're able to kind of uh, skirt around and go through a lot of different alleyways and things in order to, to get all the way to Hilda's. And Hilda is, she's fairly close to the, the gates of the palace district that you were turned away from. I mean, she's pretty oh, far down there. I forgot. That we were turned away from like eight gates? No, I forgot she was near there. Oh, yeah, she, okay. she, she is. forget that turning away. She is. Um, her spinning wheel is outside in her little uh, tiny courtyard. Um, she is not out there, but her companion, the other pretty girl that you met the first time you were here, uh, is out there diligently spinning. The doors are open, shutters are open. You can see people milling about inside. I'll walk in. Sure. You walk past the girl in the courtyard with the spinning wheel, um, and she looks up and dips a dips her head respectfully to you. Oh no. When you step inside the store, you're overcome again by that sort of sweet, uh, musky, dusty smell of all the different fabrics rolled up and, and stored uh, along the walls. Um, you're also hit with a pretty sharp wave of perfume as there are some noble women in here that are going over what looks like uh, gold and, and black silks. <laughs> gold and black silks. Um, Hilda is showing the silks to them and uh, after a moment of talking with them, she leaves them to make their decisions, whatever they're going to do, and she spies the both of you. And, and she smiles and, and dips her head, and she comes over to you expectantly. We require some finer clothes. She follows your, your gaze and you know, your finger point, and you're gesturing to the silks the women are looking at, correct? 
Uh, she says, we're St. Gall Wednesday. Yes. She says, uh, you're, you're lucky you got here when you did. You know, I'm almost out. Um, she tells you that um, she's going to finish helping these ladies out, uh, look around, uh, pick, pick any collars you like, and she'll pull them down off the shelves, and she'll see what she can do for you in just a moment. But she leaves you to look around the shelves, and she has silks in just about every color of the rainbow, so pick what you're interested in. No, I'm going to stick with black. All right. I'll also go with black, but... A couple of suck ups. Black and copper. Oh, okay. Okay. She finishes helping the ladies, uh, cutting cutting their fabric up and storing it aside. They've you know paid her a, a fair amount of money and they're leaving. Uh, she stores all of that in one of the many, many drawers um, that encompass this entire wall that's not lined with fabric. And then she comes over to you, you point out the colors of the silk that you were looking at, and the copper color she has, it's more of a more of a darker kind of burnished gold. Are you okay with that? That's all right. Never mind. Okay. You're, you're not going to get just a little fancy? No, I was going to just see if I could just embellish it on my own armor. And I would ask her if that would be enough, or if I should just go for the full. What do you mean that... Embellish, embellish your own armor. I guess I can't really do it because it's chainmail. It's not like a leather. Mm -mm. So, never mind. That's okay. Uh, she, she asks, you know, what am I, what am I making for you? A cloak. A cloak. She, you know, asks how long. She takes your measurements and and all of that, and you know, you'll just you'll tell me what she's making in a minute. I'm going to reach into my pack and pull out the old looking clothes that are... Oh, they're so wrinkled. That are really wrinkled. She, if you, like, hand them over to her to look at, to spread out on this this big cutting table, she almost gets this look of heartbreak as she's touching the fabric. And... I'm sorry, I'm on the road often. She says, these are so fine. And she's, you know, running her, her hands across the silk, and she, she frowns a little bit. And runs her hands across it again, and she says, This is Kasori silk. Her eyes light up at the confirmation, and then she's, like, running the shirt through her hands over and over. And she says, you know, you, you are on the road often. You can keep that if you want. Sir? I don't need it. I can't wear that to the festival. She... She actually, she blushes a little bit, and she's, thank you, sir. She rolls the, rolls the shirt up and puts it away because it's, at this point, it's, it's so crumpled and damaged that she can't really get a good measurement from it or anything like that. She asks, you know, what is she making for you again? Something like that. Just a shirt. She asks, do you need breeches, hose, anything like that? Let's go ahead. All full of it? Full suit. Oh, full suit. She says, what style serves? The styles of the city? The styles of the city. You know best. She nods, and she actually turns around and um, pulls another drawer out and withdraws a, about a, a nearly finished piece. Half of it is embroidered, and the other half is not, as though it's not quite there. Um, she unfolds it, drapes it out for you to look at, and it, it sort of looks like like a kurta, it's it's about a knee-length garment. It's long-sleeved, kind of has a high collar to it. Um, it's it's very simple. It's almost militaristic in design, but it's elegant. And of course, this has a whole lot of really fancy embroidery on it. But you wouldn't have to do that if you didn't want to. Would do I think that I would be able to pass um, with just the cloak, cloak and my armor, or would I would I need a full suit? It might be best for you to figure out the exact nature of Gawain's Day and the festivals that will be going on, because it might be strange for you to wear armor, be in your armor. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll turn to her and um, would a cloak be enough for Saint Gawain's Day? 
She... She, um... Out of game, she does not know that you guys are going to the palace or anything, right? You have not discussed this with her. No. No. Okay. It seems like... It seems like she would assume that you were going to be somewhere fancy. I mean, she's assuming... Has been assuming since the day she met you that you were both knights anyway. Um... She... She says that, uh... You know... Whatever you're comfortable in is is uh, what I would most recommend, but you will see mostly silks and, and velvets. In that case, I suppose I will also take the full suit. She nods, and she finishes showing you, you know, essentially the full package, and the full package includes that curtilite garment, um, and then loose-fitting hair and pants that are gathered at the ankles, and then these silk-lined, uh, pointed shoes. Do they come with a cloak? They don't, but she'll, you know, if she's making a cloak for you, she'll just add that in. And I wear my sealskin with that? Sealskin's a really, really heavy material to go with that. Yeah. I mean, you're probably, you're gonna be in all silks and velvets. Yeah, okay. She asks if, uh, you know, since you, you're you both, you know, the, hearing the militaristic type, uh, I could make half cloaks for you if you'd like. And she shows you an example too, and she actually sort of puts it on a little bit and it's it sweeps to one side, it's, it's elegant, it's more of like a station thing than it is a... Let's. Okay. So she takes a takes a quill and dips it in an inkwell and scribbles really really quickly across um, a parchment and you're close enough to see what she's writing down and it's not any discernible um, language that you can see I'm barely literate as it is yeah but she's making a whole lot of dashes and and that sort of thing and then you realize that she's not literate in uh, common writing so she has news. she has her own system for for her seamstress stuff that she's writing in, and she's she already has the materials that you guys want your stuff made of. I will also ask her of the styles. Are the men that go to the festival shaven? She smiles and then and then covers her mouth and looks horrified that you know she's let that let her amusement slip and she says beg pardon sir and, and dips her head uh, she says that uh, most men will wear their hair long if it if it is of concern to you you could go to the apothecary and or, or the alchemist perhaps and seek out a potion a potion of hair growth yes sir and she does not look am amused or, you know, bewildered. As though this is a very common thing to talk about. Oh, keep it in mind. Of course, sir. <laughs> so, at this point, she's going to ask you, do you have any precious stones, gems, any anything that you would like sewn to the material? And the way that she says it suggests that people are going to do that. We only have those pearls. We have three. Pearls. And they don't match. And they don't match. No, I do not. They're ragtag, like, different colored pearls along, Just along the shirt. Just sew a bunch of, like, gold and platinum in. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think that... Uh, no, I don't have any... Okay. All, all I have is well, the fur, but that's not a gem or anything. I'll uh, keep that in mind in the future. I mean, is this, is this something we could possibly have done in the future after purchasing these? Could we actually bring these back if we come upon gems and have oh, them Oh, of course. Them of course you could. Okay. In that case, then it'll just be the, uh, the clothes for now. She nods. Um, so the, the price she gives you for... You know, each of your respective things. Yours is going to be a little bit more expensive simply because you're bigger. Um, it's more material. In the end, the silk outfit and everything is 
100 gold for each of you. One blood. You hand a platinum over to her? Yeah, it's easier to do than 100 pieces of gold. I also don't have 100 pieces of gold, so I'm going to hand her a platinum. She takes the, the first platinum from you because you pay first, and uh, she seems to have mistaken it for a silver because her face turns really red, and, and she says, I'm sorry, sir, and she sort of stammers. I don't understand. That's not silver. She looks back down at it and kind of brushes her thumb across it. So she's trying to figure out if you're playing some sort of joke on her. Are the noble women still in here? No, they are not. She holds it up to the light, and then her face turns so red she looks like a tomato. And she covers her mouth, and she dips a really, really low bow, and it's such a flustered gesture that she almost whacks her head on the, the cutting table that's that's right next to her. And she says, you know, beg pardon, sir. And she's really flustered and breathless. As she takes the coin from you and, and goes over to a, a lockbox underneath her counter and immediately locks the platinum coins away. Uh, she, she asks, you know, or she, she tells you that she has many, many commissions at the moment, but the clothing will be ready in a 10 day. Thank you very much. Still flustered, she does a, uh, a curtsy. Okay. Well, I'll nod to her and then turn her head up, ma'am. And I'll leave. Okay. Outside you go. And the, her, her companion's out there still diligently spinning, spinning thread. Alright. The gates are like right there, right? So. Y yes. They're, they're, they're down the street a little ways. We, we were wanting nicer clothing to just go get your house, right? It's not a big deal. Okay. I mean, that... No. You think we'll be okay? Let's go find out. Only one way to find out. Alright. Head for the... What time is this? If it's not noontide, I'm not going to those gates right there. Oh. Oh, uh, it's about, at this point, 10.30 in the morning. Hmm. Yeah. Almost, it's, it's about 11 o'clock, actually, because it, it took you so long to get back and forth. It was the gates in the Sorcerer's District where they said that it's open at a different time. They gave you a bunch of confusing information. We should probably just wait until... How about we go all the way to the Noble District Gate? It is one we did not touch last time, so they're not going to recognize us, and it'll be noontide by the time we get there. So either we're just going to get access, or we're going to provide our paperwork. Very good plan. It's on the clear other side of the city. Well, <laughs> get walking. All right, I would like to open up a picture of Crescent Keep for everyone to see. Here we go. So, um, how are the clouds overhead looking? Showing. Uh, right now, it's... I mean, it's, it's uh, really, really, really dark, as though it's about to rain. I'll preemptively pull my hood up. Okay, you preemptively pull your hood up. Uh, the swollen clouds rumble overhead heavily, and as soon as you pull your hood up, you hear the very, very light pitter-patter of rain about you. Um, you're headed to the Sorcerer's Gate, correct? No. Um... I think I'm going to go through the Sorcerer's District, all the way through to the Noble District, and then the gate from the Noble District into the Palace District. Is there one of those? Yes. Yes, there is. Yes. Because where you guys are right now is you're about, about here. What's that district? Lift it up. It's on the left of the Sorcerer's District? 
the left of the Sorcerer's District. No. That that is the main plaza. That's where you watch the hangings. Yeah, can we just try and go there? You can try to go through there if you like. It's a, it's a strange district. I mean, you saw noble houses and that sort of thing, but you know they were. It was. It's a much different feel than the actual nobles district up here. More affluent or less? More. Ah. I mean, they're they're like mini palaces over there. Oh, okay. I will follow your lead. And. And you're going straight there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's just see what happens. Let's see what happens. I'm just going to point ahead towards the gate in the distance. I don't know if we can see it from here. I'll, I will keep walking. All right. Just make sure to keep my shoulders tucked against the rain. I'll enjoy the rain for just a moment. And then pull my cloak up. Okay. My hood. Wash any any dust, dirt, anything off of your face quickly mm-hmm. with the, the gentle rain. All right, so you go straight through to the, the plaza execution district. Um, there are guards at the at the gates. They do not stop you, but they do kind of look you up and down. And again, these are these guards look different from the ones that sort of patrol the city. Um, they are in plate, and if you, when you actually step in, into the district and you're walking around, you can see that there are battle mages patrolling this district. Uh, the houses, you've been to the noble district, you've seen the sprawling, you know, beautiful houses with their ornate courtyards and, and those sorts of things. Uh, the houses here don't have any courtyards that are visible to you simply because of the enormous towering walls that hide everything. The houses here, like I said, are like mini palaces. They're enormous. Um, some of the, bu- really the biggest buildings that you've seen in your life. And it strikes you and amazes you to think that there may be three or two or three people that live in each of those buildings, minus you know, servants, of course. This is so unnecessary. I'm going to pass my eyes over the far balcony that the Emperor was on during the hanging. Okay. Uh, there's no one up there at the moment. Um, this place actually, it feels, compared to the bustling streets of the Market District, it feels very deserted. People do sort of pass through here every now and then, but something you do not see is you don't see any carts whatsoever. There are no beasts of burden, there are no hay carts, nothing like that. And if anyone passes through here, they're typically dressed pretty finely, and it's it seems as though peasants and the really lower class just avoid this district altogether. I'll try and brush off my cloak. Okay. And make, make sure we look nice. You are not stopped by guards as you pass through the entire district, and you're headed straight up to the main gate, correct? Mm-hmm. All right. This gate is closed when you approach, and there are four battle mages at, at the gates and a really tall, broad-shouldered man in plate, and he's speaking to one of the, one of the mages. Um, when they hear your footsteps, he turns and looks, and he's, again, a massive boulder of a man, and he has a really jagged scar that, that runs up past his eye. Um, he, he turns and doesn't regard you hostily, but in such a way that commands you know a, a respectful distance. I'll stop way down here. Well, I'll stop alongside. So he, he nods his head after sort of running his eyes quickly over both of you, and he says, Sirs? I'll give him sort of a militaristic quick bow. Of course. Mm-hmm. Will you both roll spot for me? First die roll with the stream. Total of 18. 18? Mm, wait. 23. 13. No, 23. That was wrong. 23. 
23? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you, you both see it. It's, um, there's a little flash of gold at his throat, like, like the pin that's holding his cloak over his, over his armor. And you don't, you aren't able to immediately tell what it is, but you do. Um, it's a dragon eating its own tail. A pendant that is almost exactly like yours, but in gold. So, you know, he he says, you know, sirs, and, and addresses you. I, I don't know what that pendant means, right? I just know that he has one. You know that he has one, and this guy has one that looks almost just like it, and that it apparently means something. And he only puts it on when it's important. Yeah, you've noticed he only puts it on when it's important. Okay, um, so I'll do that militaristic bow, and I'll say, we wish to gain entry to the palace. The man nods as though he's letting you know that he understands your concerns here, and, and he steps forward, and his eyes fall on your pendant. On uh, It's over your... Uh, on your front of your cloak, right? Yeah. Okay. He sees it, and he's not quite as tall as you. I mean, he's, he's built like a barrel, but he's not... He's not... Uh, God, what are you? Six six. I mean, you're, you're you're a really really big guy. You're a really big plainsman. And he extends his arm to you in a really informal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just. You, you grab his grab his forearm. Go into it, and then do a roll strength. <laughs> yeah, roll roll strength here. I'll do the same. Cool. Oh no. Don't fudge the handshake. He's just gonna break your forearm. <laughs> uh, natural 20 for this handshake. <laughs> uh, uh, my gauntlet in hand. <laughs> I, I think that you guys are just going to be best friends. Did you also roll a ton? No, I, I rolled a 19. Oh, that's cool. Okay, that's good. That's but good you, you both you know, uh, aggressively clasp arms and, and he's, he smiles and it's, it's sort of a grim smile, but it, it's, it's not really, you know, the tone is not really directed at you. That's seems to be just his face, and he nods fiercely, as though he's, he understands. And he looks at you, and he, he offers his arm as well. Oh, clasp his arm? All right, he shakes your arm. Do I need to roll strength? No, it's okay. He, he doesn't do it with like the same intensity, but it's still respectful. You know, you're, okay. you're with this guy. Um, and he, he says, how many? And he looks at your pendant. Just the one. He, he nods and he seems to have no less respect for you after that answer. He's, but a few drakes as well. His eyes, his eyes sort of burn and he says, um, I nod, I like kind of lift my chin and like understanding. He says, your names, sirs. Griffin of Dragon's Crown. Lord Pate. So he, he nods and uh, he says, Sir Theron. And he, he actually does a really familiar uh, gesture of putting his fist over his heart and nodding, but it's not as, you know, as fierce and, and barbaric, I should say, as you, the typical plainsman greeting. It's, it's more knightly, but still really mil militaristic and kind of slightly savage. But maybe that's just the intense way he does everything. He says, um, might I ask what brings you to the palace, sirs? Speaking residence. He nods. He says, you know, do you, do you have your cards? I apologize, it is a formality. He glances over them, does not even take them. And he nods again, and he turns, goes to the gate, and the mages that are sort of leaning back on the on the gate and on the stones kind of were tilting their heads back and forth whenever you were showing him your cards and they don't look too pleased when he just walks up and and sort of waves his hand at them to open the gate but they begrudgingly do it and he he says uh have you have you been here to the palace before i have not <clears throat> he gestures and he says Follow the path, have your card ready to present. 
Thank you. You step past the big main gate. And the big main guy. You step through that gate and you don't see anything, but as soon as you pass through it, you feel that sort of clench as though something is squeezing you and you hear a buzzing crackle of energy and all of your hair stands on end. But as soon as you're past that threshold, it's over. One of the mages on the inside of the gate kind of kind of smiles at you just a little bit. It's, it's that knowing sort of cocky smile because I'm, I'm assuming that you touched your hair in game just a little bit. I can't help it. He looks away to prevent any sort of confrontation, but he's smiling. I'll follow the path. Follow All right. the path. So, up ahead, I mean, the palace, it's the most massive building you've ever seen in your life. It is grand beyond anything that you've ever witnessed. And at first you think that it's multiple buildings sort of strung together, but then you realize it's, it's not. Everything is connected. Um, and I mean, the palace is a good 10 minute walk away from where you are at the gates. Dominating, is it, what were you gonna is it say? Like up a hill. It like is. This? It is. Um, so there's a wide, straight, black flagstone path that leads to multiple gates, and because the palace rests on like the very brink of that cliff that overlooks the ocean, uh, it, it's leaving it as the highest point in Crescent Keep. It's visible to the whole city, but because everything's kind of on a decline from there, uh, the most noticeable point is the massive tower um, and there's no light coming from it, nothing like that, nothing like the, like the college. But still, it is an imposing structure. But you are distracted from the, from the palace because you've stepped through, you know, and you're now technically in the courtyards of, or the lawns of the palace, and you're struck by the fact that all of the grass, despite the fact that the weather is getting much colder and it's so soggy and, and nasty here, the lawns, the grasses are a deep, deep, vibrant green, as though it's springtime. And the sweet, sort of almost cloying smell of jasmine rolls across the wind to you. And if you look out and, and scan the lawns, you'll you see the flowers everywhere. And there are wild roses growing and the lawns are immaculately kept. It's, it's a strange paradise as though it's frozen in springtime. It makes you wonder if you were to pluck one of the flowers if it wouldn't immediately wither away. Well, I don't do that. I'm gonna not touch anything in this garden. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to just walk. Of course, and you don't even have to get close to the grass if you don't want to. The, the path you're walking on is very, very wide. I mean, two huge ornate carriages could ride side by side and be nowhere near the edges. Oh, oh wow, okay. Yeah, it's, everything here is, is grand. So, because it's on an incline, you can see the, there are sweeping walls that sort of run in, in uh, curving motions all along this incline, and there are gates and they all, one by one, block that main pathway that you guys are walking on. You have to stop at each one, present your card, and the further you go, the less and less mages there are until you reach the last gate. And it's one mage, battle mage, and he's the most heavily tattooed person either of you have ever seen. Uh, arcane tattoos cover his entire face, and they're so small and so intricate that from a distance, uh, his, his face is just entirely red, like a deep, deep crimson. He looks like he's just coated in blood, but the closer you get, you realize that isn't the case. Um, he's not wearing gloves, so you can see his hands are tattooed all the way to his fingers, and even his palms. I mean, he's covered. Can I see you passed him through the gate? You can. 
Does it seem like he's one of the last people we're going to see? He's, he seems like he's the last person until you get up to the palace. And he, unlike many of the uh, guards that you've seen, many of the, the battle mages that you saw way, way further down at like the past couple of gates, the closer you got to the palace, I'd like to also note that the guards stood straighter. Like a lot straighter. This guy is ramrod straight, standing with his hands clasped in front of him, feet spread apart, right in the middle of that gate. Sort of like a, you know, a, a daring, I, you just come at me, sort of, sort of pose. And he does regard you hostily as you approach. I'll make sure to keep my hands out into my sides. Good idea. And then I'll get on my card, expecting him to want to see it. He lifts his chin and stares really hard at the card without taking it from you. And he does the same thing to yours. And then he steps briskly aside and waves his hand. The gate crackles with light and swings open. I'll give him a military nod, respect. I'll just kind of like pretty obvious that I see him as something extremely threatening, <laughs> and I'll walk past him. Makes sense. I'll, I'll walk past him as well. Of course. So, you guys are headed up an enormous flight of stairs. It's, it reminds you a lot of Moonwatch, only instead of being carved from gleaming white stone, everything here is a dark, dark granite, almost black, but run through with uh, little silvery colored veins and flecks. And miraculously, the stairs seem to all be carved from the same stone. You see no variation, no cracks, nothing like that. Okay. No, that that's very impressive. But. <laughs> I'll look at it, but then I'll refocus. Of course, there are, I would refocus anyway because there are guards standing in plate, and there they line the uh, the entire staircase. You know, every ten steps there's a guard on you know flanking you on both sides, and they stare straight ahead, stand ramrod straight. They don't look at you at all. But you have no doubt that if you were to make some sort of strange, weird move, they would all whirl on you. I will make sure that I don't make any strange weird moves. <laughs> That's a good idea. So, you are getting further and further away from the noise of the city until at last you can hardly hear. Every now and then you might hear a shout or something from way down below, but you are up far away from everything now and it's it's sort of an eye-opener if you ever glance over your shoulder to see how high up you are <clears throat> what not just on the stairs of course the stairs are very steep also might, might i note but you can overlook the entire city the tower in the major's district is that the college is easily visible it is so, you head up those stairs, and when you finally reach the top, these massive, beautiful oak doors are open, and, I mean, they're, they're so big that you would, you would assume that they open and close them, like, once a day, <laughs> because they're, they, they really, they look so heavy and decorative that it just would not be feasible to open and close them for every noble that comes a knock in. So, plus, no guards are, are there to stop you. You know, they, they look straight ahead. It's assumed that if you can get past everyone that you've gotten past at this point, that you really deserve to be here. I'll walk on through. All right. Um, as you step into the palace, you are reminded again of Moonwatch. It's, it's so very similar, but, but, but different at the same time. Uh, the colors here, the colors here are so different. 
Um, everything is, is dark, even the big sweeping mosaics along the ceilings and the walls, which Moonwatch did not boast. Um, I suppose this is the first time, this is the first time that either of you have ever seen mosaics and that sort of art. Tiny colored stones and, and tile arranged in beautiful pictures all along the walls and ceiling. And they're so very intricate that at first, from a distance, because the ceiling is so high up, uh, you imagine that they're just paintings. But then you, you focus a little bit and realize that they're, they're PC. They're not. It's not paint. The color schemes in here are really dark. As I said, uh, you see a lot of white and black and gold and silver. And that is, that is the strict color scheme for everything that you see. The walls have uh, you know, pretty little ornate runnings about, um, let's say, elbow height that go, go across the walls. They're lined with what look like gold, just strips of gold set in the walls. Um, and there's no furniture here at all. There are no tapestries, no wall coverings, but, the, I mean, this place looks where you are, this little anteroom, looks so uninhabited, and yet it's so rich. Everything looks so expensive. It's amazing and it seems incredibly wasteful all at once. Overly decadent. So? We don't know where we're going. Help us sort of stop suddenly. Well, I'm going to continue looking ahead, and I'm expecting maybe find some sort of Amberlin or someone mm -hmm. who's just the front door man. Of course, roll listen. Don't worry about it. Total of 12. 11. Don't distract me, Gideon. So, <laughs> you, uh, you don't, you know that you should probably be listening for someone to come up and or someone to go to, but you're so struck by the architecture and just the sheer expensiveness of everything around you that you don't even really think about it. And it's not until you hear footsteps approaching, uh, they're soft and, and muffled, but, but quick. Not as though the person is running, but more of a brisk walk. And you turn around and you see a, an older man, he, he has a silvery white beard that's, that's um, combed and then braided down at the end. Um, curly, silvery white hair. He has a, a tight black simple cap on, but his clothes, he's dressed in almost identical clothing to what Hilda showed you at her shop. Um, and he is in black and silver silks, the little pointed shoes, the whole, whole shebang. He approaches you quickly and you can tell by the sort of servile stoop to his shoulders that he is a chamberlain or something of sorts to to the palace. He sees you and he, you know, gives a very, very quick but incredibly elegant and formal bow for you know, as old as he seems to be. And he says, most gracious sirs, and, and dips down in greeting. So I'm not at him. And then I'll introduce myself. I'll say, Lord Eldridge from Soria, seeking residence in Crescent Keep. Soria. He, he nods and, and, he, and he looks at you and, and does like the same bow as though to prompt your, your introduction. Pate. Lord Pate. He nods. He says, of course, sirs. And it's not really the response that you expected, but... Maybe he says yes to a lot of nobles all the time, so it just sort of comes instinctively. He says, again, most gracious sirs, and his hair falls over his shoulders um, as, he, as he bows again. He says, uh, I am at your service. Well, if you'll please lead us, where may I purchase? I already know of a place, or I could look at a few more. Who would I go to to purchase a place of residence? 
That would be me, sir. And he, and he, he bows again. And he says, if you'll please come along. And he turns and he sort of has a quick pattering step, like he's, he's used to walking quickly and quietly around the palace. Sort of seen but not heard. So he turns away, just kind of, before I follow, mm-hmm. I'm going to lean in as soon as I think I can whisper safely. Sure. And I say, I can't buy that house, not with the name I have now. Why? I guess I could. Hey, you the like- house for a noble? I guess I am at the adventure. Never you mind. Could be Technically, buying... you could buy whatever you wanted, no one would question it. You okay. could be buying it for a mistress. He is exactly right. You could be very much doing that. Well, I guess I'll pretend to be more like you, Gideon. It helps. Okay. Off you go. <laughs> Off you go. Uh, following the little servile man, he leads you through a couple of huge, ornate, domed ceilinged rooms that look exactly like the one you just passed through. Um, the windows sort of, they don't have shutters, but they do have these really intricate like lattice type coverings where you can see outside and and there are these huge drapes with big heavy drawstrings uh, meant to pull them closed on the inside. It's such exotic architecture and and designs, stuff that you've never seen before. It's beautiful but strange. He guides you through a door much smaller than the one at at the front. And she first came through, and this this room is smaller than the others, but it's no less impressive. There is one big ornate table in the center of the room, and the walls are lined with uh, the the room is round, but it's lined with bookshelves, and there are rolling ladders that that go along go along the shelves. He goes over to the table, and it's covered in papers, absolutely covered. Uh, there are two chairs, and they are on your side of the table. I'll just go ahead and sit down one, I guess. I will as well. So he sweeps papers aside and apologizes profusely for the mess as he does so. And once all the papers are out of the way, you see this huge, scrolling, intricate map of the city. Roll spot. 26. Twenty-one. Okay, so you both see it on this on this map, which is again like most of the things you've seen here, the biggest map you've ever seen. <coughs> Excuse me, and the most intricate map you've ever seen. You spot a familiar name, scribbled very, very, very small, but ornately in a corner, and it reads Cade Ackard, Lord Cade Ackard. So, <clears throat> at first you are you are overcome with with how how intricate this map is, and you don't you can't really make sense of it compared to your own map, which is fairly simplistic compared to this one. Um, every plot is labeled out. Every street is illustrated, and he asks you uh, which which district did you seek to purchase property inside. Uh, I saw a quaint little place in the market district next to, uh, I believe, a burned down blacksmith. Oh, he, he sort of, his, his uh, you know, wrinkled, sort of knobbly arthritic hands uh, find the, the market district and they, they sort of uh, roam around for a moment until they stop on, uh, on a, a little plot and the plot is uh, darkened with with ink and he says you know uh, where, whereabouts was this property he looks around to be where he's pointing right yeah he's there are a couple plots like to the left and right and like across the street i mean you can when you look at it you can clearly see uh, exactly where things are so you know that the house you were seeking to buy if you're looking at the blacksmiths the house is on the left side 
So I'll, I'll try and point to it, and it's that darkened plot. The darkened plot, you would assume, is the blacksmith that burned. So I'll point to the relevant one. Okay, he, he, uh, he looks at it, and, and there are numbers and letters in really, really, really tiny script, and he takes out of one of his pockets this enormous glass, and when he holds it up to his eye, his eye is magnified and enormous. And that's probably the first time you've ever seen a magnifying glass to you. I'll assume Plainsman. He he leans over really, really close to the to the map and is nodding and he quickly dips a, a quill in ink and on another parchment he scribbles some numbers and letters and he says, uh, did you seek to purchase this property today? Yes, I did. Very good, sir. And, and he nods. He withdraws from the desk a whole lot of uh, official-looking documents and those sorts of things. He gets your name from you. What name do you give him? I'll give him Lord Eldridge. Lord Eldridge. He says, uh, should, I, should I mark any other names uh, on, this, on this document? <laughs> that is all right. I just, do not collect antiques. Just the one. Very good, sir. Just the one. Just the one. He writes down a whole lot of stuff, and the whole time he's murmuring to himself, and that quill is just going a thousand miles an hour, zipping across that paper. Um, he eventually stops, and he blows on on the on the paper the parchment wags it a little bit and then he gingerly pushes it over to you and holds out a quill for you to take so oh, no. hold holding this out to you um he says you know gracious sir if, if you would please please uh sign the bottom of this okay you know all right all right, Plainsmen, are you ready to do some reading? Do I know that you don't know how to write? I don't I know how to write. I, I don't think that you know this. But I'm going to do my best to write well. I have an excuse if it doesn't go well. Okay. Oh, no. Well, no. you do need to do some quick reading because there's no, like, big X of where you need to sign, and there's no, okay. there are no lines. I do know because we, we had to do the... Never mind. I'll uh, hold up a hand and then just kind of, like, look over it. <laughs> like pretend like you're looking over the finer details of this agreement, just but in, in fact you're just <laughs> going going over the first like, line. Really <laughs> That's no, okay. No. It's, it's, it's fine. There's just a place where he needs to sign, right? No, there's not a line. There's not a line. There's not a line. And I mean, he did say sign at the bottom, so you would assume that you could just. I just need to make sure it's all in order. You need to make sure that your name looks good, maybe. <laughs> um, I'll lightly grab the quill. While you're reading, it's in my hand. I will. Why don't you not sign off on my antique? Very well. The older man is regarding you both with enormous eyes, like he's worried something bad's about to happen. <coughs> okay, so can I gather information from this? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Or discern script? Discern it's script. no, That's just worse roll. go ahead and roll intelligence on. It's just straight intelligence roll. What is it? Total of ten. Ah. Okay. Uh, well, you can tell that this looks like an official document, and it looks like the house is going to belong to you and nobody else. And you think that your name would look good there at the bottom. Can right. I can I speed read that document? Uh, you can attempt to, but you can't read much faster than he can. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to attempt to do a good signature at the bottom. Okay. A form signature. <laughs> I have no idea what's... Just, what it's, just this, roll this for it. Roll. Just, just roll for it. You. Straight roll. Straight roll. Here we no, go. No, no, no. You, you insulted me. <laughs> <laughs> what you get... I'm just trying to play the part. Okay, so you put the you put the nib to the to the parchment, and it's been a long time since you've held a quill. So when you initially press it down, you press too hard, and ink just <sighs> spreads across the bottom of it. But you play it off and uh, kind of clear your throat and sweep out of that little puddle of ink you've made, 
and sort of painstakingly get your name written. And it looks neat by the time you're done, other than that huge splotch, but you do have to take some time to get it written on there. So as soon as I'm done, I'll hand it back to him, but then I'll just stare at him, like daring him to call me out on my signature. He does not meet your eyes at all, and instead, when you hand it over to him, I mean, that puddle of ink might like run off, so he very carefully like kind of cups the parchment and takes it off, puts it like on a corner of the desk so that it, it can run off in the floor instead of... On his nice map. On, yeah, on everything else on the desk. He says nothing about that. And he says, you know, very, very, very good, sir. Uh, if, if you could wait uh, just a few moments, I shall produce a, a copy for, for your own records. Gracious sirs. He takes the, uh, takes the parchment after it's dried a little bit, produces a clean one of uh, lesser quality. It's lesser quality parchment, but it's still nice. It's pretty. And he takes a crystal out of the desk, sort of looks like the magnifying lens that he was holding, magnifying Let's crystal. And he holds it and, and sort of runs it just like this over the paper, over the parchment. And as though he's just running it, running it across the parchment, holding it back and forth. And then he takes that crystal and he rolls it, actually physically touches it to the paper and rolls it across this other parchment. And as he does, it's almost like ink is rolling off of it. All of the lettering, everything that is on that other document is now being essentially printed onto this one. Even your signature at the bottom. And he accidentally, his thumb just barely, barely brushes the ink, and you can see that it's fresh ink, because it smears slightly, ever so slightly in one corner. He blows it out, makes sure that it's dry, you know, gingerly tapping it, and then uh, preserving it in a scroll case, he rolls it up, ties it up for you, and hands it, hands it to you. And he smiles and dips his head again, as though that's the end of the business right there. Okay, I'll stand up. I will also stand. He looks flustered suddenly. Yes. The, uh, the price is 30,000 gold, sir. Ah. He dips his head and looks at the floor. For that little place in the market district? His face falls, and he looks down at the desk, and he kind of looks like a deer in headlights. He, he says, I, yes, yes, sir. You can, you might be able to haggle with this guy. He seems fairly uh, easy to push around. So... I'll get out 120 platinum, push each group over to him, and then end on the last 100, on the 120, and then say, The blacksmith's burned down. The side of the building is scorched up. I was not aware of this, sir. This is what I'm willing to offer. He eyes the money, and uh, you see his eyes kind of squint a little bit as though his eyesight is not wonderful. And what is the total that you push over to him? 12,000. He dips his head and, and he says, uh, my apologies, sir, I, I, I could not accept less than 15,000. I want you to give him 12. You can go I'll for put, it again. You can I'll roll put, for it. I'll put 30 platinum on the table. Okay. He looks at the money that you've put down, and he looks at you as though he's confirming that this is okay. He sort of does a stiff bow this time, and he, very carefully, he does not slide the money over to him. He Instead, he touches his fingers to it, 
and does a miraculously quick count, even faster than Mentha. And then he does not touch it. He leaves it on the table. And he looks at you and, and he says, would you be purchasing property today, sir? No. Very good, sir. May I assist you in further matters, sirs? Kind of out of game. Yeah. But would I gather that there's any kind of key or anything? Because I didn't try the door. Um, I could ask, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's... Typically, you, you would go to a smith and have them forge locks and things for you. And typically, they were just dead bolts inside. But you could you could have locks forged. Yeah, I'll just do it. So, still standing up, and a bow, just give him a nod, and then turn away. Okay. He does not move a muscle as you leave. I will leave. Out you go. <clears throat> Back into that big, breezy hallway slash antechamber thing with the lattice windows. You can smell the jasmine from the gardens rolling in through those windows. After we get a nice distance away from the room, because I'm assuming it might echo in here. Oh yes, there's nothing in here to absorb the sound. I'll wait a little while and then I'll say, I suppose you'll want the key made as well. Not necessary, no. I apologize if I insulted your house. No, you were playing the part. I was playing the part. So was I. You're very pointed with your coin. 30,000 gold <laughs> for that little place. I'm not even a noble. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Oh, man. Are you guys headed out, out? Uh, I do believe or, so. I don't. I mean, I'm, you are. You're up at the palace. Are there any big open hallways that just kind of veer off in the middle? Yes. Nowhere? Yes, there are. There are also guards. Every now and then you see a battle mage pass by, heavily tattooed. Then I won't do that. <laughs> okay. But okay. That's I good. I am going to take it in. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Memorize everything. Yeah, try. both of you, uh, I, I'd like you to roll wisdom, if you will, to sort of memorize what you can for, for this layout. Uh, everything is very open, very broad and wide here, so there aren't a whole lot of intricacies to remember. Um, yeah, I ignore all the details. Yeah. Like, just where doors are. Of course. Really basic. <laughs> Total of 12. <laughs> For wisdom. Okay. What is it? It's a six. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I mean, yeah. you were upset that I was mad at you about the you. Uh, you look around. I'm am stressed because I'm. You look around, memorizing what you can, but to be honest, there's there are really too many guards walking around, and you don't want to look suspicious by peering down hallways because every time you it's, it seems like every time you do a battle mage walks around a corner and they stalk like panthers and they look ready to pounce on you so you don't uh you don't really worry a whole lot about memorizing this layout at the front but you do remember where the door is you're you're fine there that's always good got that down being able to get in and out of, of a place all right you're outside now and it's really, really humid. And it's almost warm today. Almost. When the breeze blows, it's a little cool, uncomfortably so, but... I'm assuming it's not going to feel like this once we get outside of the gate. So... All the way down. All the way down, repeating the process. Mm. Every gate. Do they just let us out? Or? No. They want a card. They want your card the out. every time. No. <laughs> Eventually, I'll just walk with it out. Sure. The uh, well, the first, the first gate that you go to, you know, with your battle mage friend, um, he opens the gate. He opens the gate up. Crimson. Crimson tattoos. He looks at you. You know, you present your card, and then he meets your eyes for. One, two seconds that just feel just like a little too long. 
He looks at the both of you. I'm going to purpose to look at Gideon to see if he may just meets the gaze of this battle mage. You see me blink slowly. Okay. He lets you go. And then the other guards, um, either in plight or battle mages, look over your card, let you out. If anything, most of them seem to be not in a hurry to let you out, but they, they don't want to upset a noble by keeping them waiting. So they, they're pretty quick. Uh, you, when you get back down to the gate, the cocky battle mages that were leaning against the stones and, you know, murking at you and stuff, they are not there. They are instead replaced by a couple of guards in plate and one battle mage who is standing straight, not leaning, leaning against the gate at all. Okay. So they flipped then. No, like their, their number, because it, it was... That's what they get for laughing at my hair. It, no, it was like four battle mages, and then the guy in plate, and now it's dudes in plate, and one battle mage. Huh, okay. Um, your friend is not there. That's too bad. Um, trying to make my way all the way out, and my house is next to the burned down blacksmith. Do I remember any other blacksmiths in the market district? Not in the market district, you don't. The only one I know... Twice in one day. Well, we're going to go back tonight anyways, or at least I am. What do you mean? To where? Mentha's. I bet you want <laughs> She has my curious. Well, that's right. I'm gonna drop the no-go stick because that is really uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Well, I need to make a locking key as soon as possible and go fetch hide off. Actually, I think I'd like to do that first. Fetch hide off? Do we even know where that hulk of a man is? We'll check the tavern and then we'll check the brothel. And then we'll check every other tavern. And brothel. And brothel. And if we have to, we'll ask a passerby. He's going to stand out. So which tavern is first? The one we have rooms at. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it getting? <laughs> Don't tease him. That was one time, all right? I was flustered. <laughs> Okay, if you don't mind, all the way to the tavern that I don't know the name of. The one in the market district with that ore. Okay. Um, when you get there, uh, it's it's pretty packed. I mean, it's, it's about lunchtime at this point. Um, and I mean, this is the main meal of the day for most lay people. I'm hungry. I forgot. There is meat cooking. <laughs> oh, yes. I there, there it. is meat cooking. It is, it's stew, but, but it's it has meat. still meat. And you know, obviously, people can tell when meat's cooking because this place is packed. Uh, you see Chagall over in the corner, you know, or not in the corner, but against the wall, at his table where four other people could possibly sit if they wanted to, but they are not. Instead, people are choosing to stand instead of sitting beside him. And, you know, with good reason. He's a frightening, he's a frightening guy. He's, he's about as tall as you are, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, or so. Um, sort of pale, dusty green skin and those huge pointed tusks that ride up over his lip. Uh, one of them pierced through with a ring. What a badass. He is a badass. His dreadlocks, you know, are, are pulled back uh, behind him and they, they have a uh, rings in, in them as well. He's overall a really barbaric looking character. Most people seem to avoid him, except for Faye. The, the girl with the red-headed girl with her hair in plates, she's over there serving him beer. Despite the fact that the whole place is packed and you know lots of people need serving, she's making sure he gets what he needs to get. I'll spot your food and ale. It's the least I can do. Do you mind checking? No. So I'll go to the bar, and I'll go upstairs. All right. 
Um, you go upstairs first. And uh, check how to hide off the door. Mm. No? Just... Alright, you knock. Uh, there's no response. I'll, like, try the door. You try it, it is unlocked. Just let it swing open. Sure. The room is empty. Are any of his things here? Oh, that's right. He doesn't really have... Oh, he doesn't really have things. things. I mean, he has, he has his weapon, but that's not here. And now he has a curious, but... That's not here either. Very well. I'll close his door. Okay. I'll come back downstairs. At this point, unless you wanted to talk with Faye or the, or the tender, um, you've gotten two big bowls of, of stew and two tankards of ale. Probably really hungry. And even if you weren't, that meat smells good. I'll start with two. Okay. Protein. One for both of us, and then I'll see how I feel. Uh, and then the drink, and then... Well, they've, they've rolled out some strong stuff, too, so it, it depends. Do you, did you want beer, or did you want ale? Ale. Oh. Gotcha. So two big tankards of that, two big bowls of food. So the whole thing is going to come out to a silver piece. This quaint little bowl. It's a no. big ass bowl of food. No, I'll uh, <clears throat> take it up. And it comes with a little piece of bread to like mop the broth up with. I'm not gonna sit with Show Gold, but I think I'll give him a nod if we make eye contact. Do you do you make eye contact with him? He looks at you as you pass by. The most impers almost imperceptible nod of his head. Something. That's a lot from him. <laughs> oh, I'll set it down. Sure. Uh, you managed to... The, the only spaces open besides the ones next to him um, are some chairs next to some really loudly yakking merchants that are arguing over a map. Uh, and Is it a different group than yes, the first time we were? Yes, it oh. is. <laughs> it is. And it's, you hear familiar dialects. So it's not, uh, it's not the Kasori that you heard with the other merchant group. Okay. I'll come back down the stairs, find you, and come sit next to you. Not at you for the porridge. By porridge, I mean stew. That's right. <laughs> and I will begin eating it. Of course. Uh, as you sit and eat, <clears throat> the merchants are, are arguing really loudly, and you realize what they're arguing about because they, they start to... They're all dressed in fine clothing, you know? And you realize that they're silk merchants and they're arguing about silk prices and that sort of thing, and they seem to be making a really big deal of it because you hear, and you, you don't really understand the language that they're speaking, because you're not from this area, but you do understand Hilda, you recognize that name, and you hear a strange variation of Gawain, as though they're talking about the festival. And they are just heatedly arguing and they're like grabbing their silk shirts and like showing them to each other, like slapping each other's hands and stuff as though they're arguing about who's, whose silk is best, who's gonna sell their stuff here and where. And that is, is the loudest conversation in this room and no one is telling them to quiet down. Seems like, to be honest, Faye doesn't even go over to their table. If they need anything, uh, one of them has to you know, flusteredly get up and go over to her to ask for something. Just gonna... I'm just gonna enjoy my drink. <laughs> Thank you, sound effects. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Alright. Hot off? Oh. I'm assuming no. No. He's not in his room, nor are his. nor are either of his two things. <laughs> I have no idea where that man has gone. Here's a thought. I'd like to stop by the bookbinder. Why? Well, we might be down a plainsman. And we already had one up before we lost him. Seeking companionship on a deadly road. Well, indeed, but... I'll leave it here, and I'll point to my place of residence. Okay. Are we not going to look for Hideoff? After my meal. 
Um, you hear kind of a, a crackling sound uh, start up, and you realize that behind you, Faye has gone over to the, the big fire pit in the center of the room and has uh, tossed a couple of new logs in there, and you feel a fresh waft of heat across your back. And it's, it's comfortable at this point, because as you were walking through the city, it was still humid. Of course, that wasn't just a, an attribute of the courtyards um, because of the threat of rain, but it's, it's still cool outside. The warmth is nice. Okay. Um, as she does so, I'll try and get her attention. She uh, recognizes you and comes over to you, and she's sort of wiping her hands on her apron as she approaches, and she smiles her pretty straight smile. You wouldn't happen to have seen a rather large man wearing an ornate cuirass. The plainsman you travel with. Yes. Uh, the other plainsman. <laughs> she, she smiles at you. She says, uh, I haven't seen him about. I mean, he, he went out yesterday morning. Haven't seen him since. He's missing then. She sort of cocks a brow at you. Yeah, he's, uh, he's his own man. Most plainsmen seem to be. They are. She smiles a little and holds eye contact with you, just for a second. She says, can I fetch you anything? I don't believe so. She nods and you hear- Maybe one more of these, not half a drink. So she, she nods and she picks it up and you hear a like a knocking, banging sound, like someone's whacking their table, and it's just like two short raps. I'll look over at Shogol. Shogol is sitting up in his seat and is bristling. Like the the dreadlocks on his head seem to even be slightly flared. He has dreadlocks. And and he is watching you like a lion from across the room. And Faye turns around and she goes, sit down, and, and waves her hand at him. And then walks, kind of, kind of swaggers over to the over to the bar to fill up your your cup and bring it back to you. And then she goes over to him and actually physically like he looks he looks up at her, but only ever so slightly because of how tall he is and you know, her height, even with him sitting. And she physically pushes him down in his seat or puts a hand on him as though she would do so, and he relents and sits down. But he turns that nasty look on you again. So my back is to him, right? Yes. He's staring at you. I'm just gonna put up my hands and nod at him. Sure. Uh, will take you, that will you just yes. roll a roll a diplomacy roll here to really convey that you meant? I have no intention. For no your intention. Your bar winch. Your, your bar <laughs> winch. <laughs> sure, sure, go for it. I should yell that at him. See how he feels about that. A total of twenty-four. Twenty-four. Okay, so his gaze visibly cools when you put up your hands, and it's 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 a very it's a plainsman thing to do because I mean lots of people do it, but in your own culture, when you put your hands up like this close to your chest, it shows you're not going for any weapons, anything like that. It's it's a very not submissive gesture, but it's an amiable one, and he seems to recognize it, and his gaze cools, and you see. The, his bristling hair just fall ever so slightly. I think we can still be fast friends. I don't know if that's true. It's 11.50, gentlemen. Out of game. Woo. No, get out. So, what's gonna Not happen? What's... Oh, What's gonna happen is uh, we're gonna take a break and we will be back. The slideshow will be back at 12.45. We will be back playing, streaming. You can see us at one o'clock. Until then, we're gonna take a short break. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.